This will be my 30th summer um, at Tel High with Hope Hope Network. When Pastor Gary, I met Pastor Gary when he was 15. That was the year I started doing the camps. And, and just to see him grow up, you know, as a camper, then a, then a counselor, then a worship leader, then a director for many years. So it's just a treat. And I just, I, every time I think about it, my heart just melts thinking he is pastoring the church that he was an eight-year-old at. It's just like, ugh. It's three years now, but I still feel like it just started last Sunday. It just blesses my soul. So anyway, uh, we have a lot to cover, and um, I'm very grateful to Pastor Derek. He said, Michael, not one minute past 10.30. And so that's, he's my kind of guy. So what, what I'd like to do, though, um, I'd like all the leaders in the room, and adults, even if you're visiting, if I would like young people, if you would bow your heads before the Lord, and I'm going to ask all the guys to take off your hat and head coverings, and uh, as we're gathering around the Word in the presence of the Lord, thank you. And I'm going to ask all the adults and the leaders in the room, you just stand up and go among the young people um, and lay your hands on their heads. And as you do, uh, just ask Jesus to touch them. And kids, just bow your heads before the Lord when they do and ask Jesus if He will touch you. Because uh, I can be very anointed to preach, but it's so important that the people who listen are anointed to listen. So we're just welcoming the Lord's presence. We love it that we are His children and we can go right from playing our hearts out and, and being crazy right into His presence. And we're still His. That's what camp is like. When we play, we play. And then when we pray, we pray. So the leaders just go among all the young people and just make sure you get everyone. Father, I'm asking as the leaders and the adults, touch the children, Lord, the young people, they're not children, they're young people, Lord, that you would touch them as well by your spirit. When the Lord Jesus Christ was on the earth, they brought young people to him, and it says that the Son of God in human flesh, he took them in his arms, he laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. There isn't a person in this room who knows Jesus who wouldn't love for the Lord to come physically and hold you right now. But we know that the next time he comes physically to the earth, he's going to be on a horse with armies behind him. So, Michael, how do I get that hug from Jesus now? You get it through his people. And so that's why I like to do this when I'm with young people. It's just to have the adults in the room just touch them in Jesus' name. Oh, dear Jesus, our, our world is rapidly going down the sewer, Lord. Spiritual wickedness in high places who don't care about the young. They're polluting the young. They're coming after the young. They're teaching the young things that are an abomination to you. So I'm asking, Lord, that in this gathering tonight, that these precious young people will know, wait a minute, there's another spirit in the universe. It isn't like the spirits that I feel in school. And in the neighborhoods, I went to church Wednesday night. There was a Holy Spirit in that place. And that's what I'm asking for, Holy Father. These kids will know that they have been in contact and an encounter with the living God tonight. Come, Holy Father. to a live audience in six months. And the last place I did was right here. I did your Christmas services. It's a treat and it's an honor to be in Aaron's church. So Lord, we, we invite you to come in Jesus' name and for his glory. I need a big favor. I would like everyone to look around the room. Is there a uh, And is there, are there, I need two people in the room who don't know each other. Look around, and, and you, you, somebody point to me, like, are there two people in the room who've never seen each other before? Is there anyone you see? Who am I? Her? Oh, right here? I need you, and I need you. Real quickly. Okay? That's no, okay. So you two have never seen each other, you don't know each other? All right. All right, so what I need you to do, you come on over here, and you're going to face him. You're going to come and face her. Closer. All right, just look at each other.
Did they know anything about each other? Anything. What if they stand here for five more hours and just stare at each other? Will they know each other any better? Why? They didn't what? They didn't talk! Thank you. Very good sentence. No hurry, you can sit down. Thank you. They didn't talk! Very what are you talking about? Everything you are, young people, everything you believe, everything you feel, everything you have an opinion about, everything that is inside of you, no one knows. Unless you talk. Hello? Why is it? Why is it that way, Michael? Because you are image bearers. You're made in the image of God, and that's the way God is. The greatest way by far that we know who God is, young people, is by what he says. But Michael, what about miracles? And he does all these awesome miracles and things in nature. He does. But even when God does a miracle and a work of power, we still need words to explain what happened and why. This is my object lesson, and it, and it pales in comparison. This is what I use for God. John chapter 4, verse 23. God is spirit. He's infinite. He's immense. He's vast. He's omniscient. He's all-powerful. He's eternal spirit, a spirit you do not see, touch, taste, or smell. But it's more real than the physical things we have in this room right now. Now, what happens when God wants to get who he is? And let me, let me let's see, I have so many object lessons. Pastor Gary told me too, many years ago I had too many, and he was right back that more. I can't stop. Now, this is my object lesson for the glory of God. The glory of God. What do you mean by all the colors represent his amazing love, his slowness to anger, his loving kindness, his tender mercies, his awesome wrath. I've been doing a series on video production for many, many weeks on the wrath of God, and I love God more because of it. His wrath is adorable. It's not a weak part of his nature. His wrath, because it comes from him who is absolutely perfect, is wonderful. The glory of God is his perfections. Now, this is all has to do with what we're going to do tonight. But when God wants to speak, he's got to use words. What he feels, what God feels very deeply about. How does he get it to us? He puts it in a word. And from the essence of God, it comes out in forms of words. And again, that's how we know who he is. Because we're made in his image, and that's how we work. Now, what is the word of the Lord? The word of the Lord is living. It's alive. All scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is God-breathed. <sighs> Where is your breath? Right? Where is it, though? Where does it come from? Very good. Where, where are your lungs? Inside of you. I was hoping she'd say that. You see, when God breathed out scripture, <sighs> he moved on men who wrote as the Spirit of God carried them along, the Apostle Peter said. The Word of God is living and it's active. The Greek word there for active is energes. That's where we get our English word energy from. The Word of God is full of life. With you, Lord, Psalm 36, 9, is the fountain of life. His Word is alive. I have so many notes that you'll never want me to come back. But i got to do it some so that when we do our Bible marking, you're going to understand why we are doing it. Acts 7, 38, Stephen was getting stoned, just about to get stoned. It was the last message, first and last sermon he ever gave. He was about to get stoned, but what did he say to the people who were about to stone him? Moses handed down to you, in other words, the five books of Moses, living oracles. Moses himself, in Deuteronomy 32, 47, he told the Jews, this was before Moses died, he said that these are not idle words. They are your life. Why are the words of God so alive? Because they come from him. Who is the fountain of life? John 1, 4. Jesus said, Him was life. Now, what else can we say that the Word of God has? And again, this is the symbol for God. Okay? The Word of God is powerful. And it is. What kind of power, Michael? The Word of God is powerful and it's sharper than two, any two-edged sword. What does it do, Michael? It pierces. Some Bible versions say it penetrates. And when the Word of God, touched by the Spirit of God, is given to a person whom God is on the, path, on the path to convict, it says that it cuts the person right in half. And it says it divides you between your soul and your spirit. 
In other words, it divides you and judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So you hear a word from God, whether it's reading it or hearing it from someone else, and all of a sudden God takes his sword and goes, boom, and he pierces you. And you guess what he's doing, beloved? This thing that you're thinking or doing or this attitude you have doesn't please me. This does. That's what the word of God does. It has power. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What's the gospel? The gospel is a collection of words. Why was Paul not ashamed of it? Here's why. Because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes it. So these words, because they come from God, are so powerful that if you believe them, it keeps you from the lake of fire that burns with sulfur and brimstone forever and ever and ever. And the way that you avoid it is by believing the gospel. The Greek word for it, that it's the power of God, is where we get our English word dynamic. Dunamis. That's what the gospel is. And then Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. He said, the preaching or the message of the cross, remember, the message of the cross, if we grab it and hold on to it, it's how we get to heaven. He said, that message to those who are perishing is foolishness. Your friends who aren't saved, they think they're nuts. But to those of us who are being saved, what did Paul say? It's the power of God. Why? Because the words that God speaks, they come from his nature. So when God speaks, it's like this. His words, they come out of him, and they radiate with the same power that is in him. That's why it's so important that when we speak, we have the Holy Spirit taking the word of God. Now, in the light of all of this thing, I could have said so much more. How do we handle the word of God? Knowing what it is to some little degree. In fact, the Lord says, let me, let me do a little bit more. How, how effectual is the word of God? In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, the Lord says, Just like the snow and the rain come down from the heavens, and it waters the earth, so that it gives seed for the sower, and it gives food for the eater, and said so in the same way, the word that comes out of my mouth, it won't return unto me empty. It will accomplish what I spoke it for. God's word is always effectual. When the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost was preaching to the people who crucified Jesus, after he preached to them, it says, when they heard these things, it said, they were pierced to the heart. That's what the literal Greek says. And another place in Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 7, after the Apostles preached or Stephen preached, it says that in the literal, literal, literal Greek, when they preached, it says the people were sawn asunder. The word of God was so powerful that it cut the people right in half on the inside. That's what the word of God does with them. Now, how do we approach it? And I could have said so much more. In the light of that, how do you treat the word of God? With white gloves. How many of you ladies know what the white glove treatment is? Right? house was clean, you go through it with the white glove treatment. You just rub your finger along the mantle looking for dust, right? The white gloves is how we handle the Word of God. The Word of God, young people, will be your best friend or will be your worst enemy. I have, an, I have a, a guy I went to Bible school with. And I have this object lesson and I didn't bring it because I brought too many of this. But this guy was in the army. But he was missing a hand. So I don't know if I asked him when we were at Bible school years ago, or if someone else did, and I found out. Somebody asked him, Bruce, why? Why are you missing your hand? Here's what he said. When he was in the army, he was working on a shell, like those and guns that shoot far away, and he couldn't get the, the, the warhead off, so he got really angry and frustrated, he whacked it with a wrench and blew his hand off. That's the way the Word of God is. If you treat it irreverently, it'll blow up on you, sooner or later. But if you treat it, beloved, with reverence and respect, it'll be your powerhouse. It'll be your comfort. It'll be your best friend. And that's what we're going to learn from you. So what happens? We take the Word of God, and every time the Lord sees you young people pick up your Bible, you know what He sees? When you're going to it with a heart that wants to learn something, you know what He sees? He sees a golden shovel in your hand. You know why? Because when you pick up the Word of God, because you want to know Him better, your heart is strong because you need to know it better. God delights in that. And in his eyes, he sees you holding the golden shovel. 
And what you're doing, you're starting to, if you want to know, you don't want to just do a casual reading and show it. Oh, my Bible reading plan, I got to do two more chapters today. That kind of reading doesn't please God. When you go to the text of Scripture knowing it's God breathed and it's filled with power. And you want to know it because you know it came right from the heart of God. You want to know that like that? And watch what happens every day. Something wonderful happens. And it makes all the difference whether your Bible is boring or it blows you right out of your seat. Ready? Spirit of God comes. Spirit of God comes. I'm a preacher and the Bible is boring to me. Without the Spirit of God. I mean, the Spirit of God is the third person of the Trinity who moved on the man who gave the Scripture. So he's the one that we want to come and we study it so that he will illuminate it for us. What happens when the Holy Spirit of God comes? How many of you have read the same Bible verse like maybe ten times? And on the eleventh time, it was like it jumped out at me. Whoa, I never saw that before. You know what I'm talking about? You know what that was? Some people say, oh, I got a new revelation. No new revelation. It wasn't a revelation. It was an illumination. The Holy Spirit gave you his interpretation of what the verse meant. Now, what happens when that happens, beloved? Here's what happens. All of a sudden, you read the same Bible verse at the 11th time, and think the lights go on. Why? The Holy Spirit of God moved on you. You gave him time to give you the interpretation. And you're like, whoa, I never saw that before. And the lights come on. Then what happens? You discover the jewels of the Scripture. How many times have you read it? It's like, oh, this is boring. If the Bible is boring, it's because you're boring. No one wrong with the Bible. It's God's Word. It's filled with power and energy. So if it's boring, it ain't wrong with Him, right? It's with us. That's why we desperately need the Spirit of God to come on us. But when the Spirit of God turns the light bulb on above your head and you start to see the, the precious, priceless jewels of truth from the Scripture, everything changes. That's what happens, Michael. And this happens. Please work. Can you see it? When you see the truth of Scripture by the Holy Spirit, what's that, Michael? I used to have it higher, but it's dangerous. It's a fountain. What happens? Jesus said, whoever believes on me, John chapter 7, from his deepest parts of his being shall flow rivers of living water. And that's what happens when the Spirit of God takes the text of Scripture, opens your mind to understand it, the light comes on, you see the jewels, and you know what? All of a sudden, you start worshiping. You might not get your guitar or start dancing or start singing, but you're, like, you're in awe. Oh, my dear. Then no one has to tell you to read the Bible. You can't stop reading it. That's the difference, young people. And all from the deepest parts of your being flow rivers of living water. Like, oh, my dear. God is so awesome. I didn't see that before. Then what happens? Heard it. You're not done yet? Oh, no. Oh, no. After that happens, this happens. Who knows what this is? It's my little nuclear reactor. Katie, for many years, I thought nuclear glow was green. And Ray Bonner, a dear friend of Katie's and mine, uh, he worked at a nuclear power plant for many years, and he goes, no, the glow is violet. <laughs> but oh, so I changed the bulb. What happens, young people, when all of this happens and this happens, you go nuclear. All of a sudden, you have power you didn't you can stand in front of people and say what you feel, and you're not afraid. Where'd it come from? The text of Scripture, the Holy Spirit revealing it to you. And all of a sudden, you're bold. I'm the biggest scaredy cat I know. I'm, ter I'm afraid of people. I'm ashamed to tell you that. In myself, I am. I've told the Lord many times, Lord, I see so many of these big-time preachers cowering and caving in to the pressure of the culture. Lord, I'm just telling you now, if you leave me to myself, I will do it. It's got to be him. I'm going to boast how weak I am that the power of Christ might rest upon me. That's what Paul said. So there it is. Now watch. Then what happens? Jeremiah chapter 29, verse, chapter, verse 23. Is not my word like... It worked earlier. Come on. Is not my word like fire? And, my, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. I have no idea why. When I, 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 my heart has been so burdened for this meeting with you. I don't know why. And what the text that was in my spirit that I was laying on the floor in my back room this morning. I just wanted to give the morning and pray for you. I felt like 
There's, there's a rock that needs to be broken to pieces. And I don't, it doesn't mean anything bad about it. I just, Lord, there's something there that just needs to break. Lord, your word says it's like a fire and a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. That's what I kept praying. And I prayed and prayed and prayed. And after a while, I told Kim, I'm over here. No, I don't sense that anymore. Like whatever, maybe one, whatever it was, I felt like the Lord had dealt with it. Now, this is the process why? See, you thought maybe we're just going to come tonight and mark our Bibles, which we're going to do. But I want to show you why it's so important to mark your Bibles. When our children, we have three children, when they were small, the thing I was going to try to teach you tonight, I taught them. I got them all a little Bible, believe it or not, that was translated for Eskimos. So it had a very limited, uh, it was called, the, I think it's called the New Life Version. Many years ago, it was translated for Eskimos. Well, what dirty why do you use that Bible? Because it had a very limited English vocabulary for my very young children. Easier to understand. And I got them their markers. And I started, I taught our own children this method. And now we've been doing it at camp. Jake has been in it many times. We've been teaching it at camp. Oh my dear. Every year, it was Pastor Gary's idea. Uh, I can't even, I don't even know how many years. And so, here's the principle. How many stomachs does a cow have? Four? Very good. Yeah. And um, what do you think about Calvary during the church? Here's why. Here's the principle, young people, that we're going to do this marking system. Is that a cow that eats its grass, they're not like us. You know, we go get a happy meal with down and we're done in 20 minutes. Not even. But a cow will eat the grass and then choose it again in another stomach or a cut and another one and another one. That's the principle to power with the Word of God. That, is the, that determines whether I have boldness and confidence to preach or not. If I have this the word of God ruminating in me again and again and again. I just can't stand, stand up and start clattering. I've got to be with God. I've got to have his word deep in me. So again and again and again and again, preparing for this. The same text of scripture, again and again and again. I wanted it in me so that it would come out to you and rip your hearts like a grip on it. Now, I, I, there was a lot on here I didn't share. But I'm going to share one more thing I got to. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and it says, The devil has blinded the minds of those who don't believe the gospel, so that they might not see the light of the gospel. What's the gospel again? It's words. It's words. They might not see the light of the gospel. Watch now. gospel, in the words of your Bible. And here it is again, Jesus Christ in his manifold perfections, the glory of Christ. And the devil, for those who choose not to believe, he has given, been given permission by God to blind their minds so they don't see it. But for those of us who love him, we see the glory of Christ in the written text. That's what we're going to try to do tonight. Now, so what we do You all have your papers and your markers. Here's how we do it. I don't use it all the time. In fact, I rarely use all of it, but I want to give you the deluxe version. So again, I usually take this portion of the word, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. So if you're doing this, and remind me, I have a YouTube channel, and I have this whole teaching on my YouTube channel. I can give that to Pastor Derek to get to you if you want to look at it. Uh, at a camp like 16 years ago in Florida. But anyway, so here's the principle, young people. When we're looking at a certain text of the scripture, we want to chew it again and again and again, like a cow with grass. So what do we do? The very first time, and you just take a small part. Don't take a whole chapter. Just take a small part of the scripture. All right, and again, like I've said, we're doing Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. So what do you do? The first time, you read the portion, no marking. Just read it. Now... The second time you read it, you use paint. Paint is for God, angels, and people. Holy angels. So who wants to read out loud? This is the only time where I encourage young people to interrupt. I, want, I need somebody to read, and they're going to read verses 1 through 4. As you do, when you see a paint, say, you read the, the person's name. Remember, paint is either God, Jesus, men, or angels, or sometimes animals. All right, you read it, 
And when you get to the place where you think it needs to be pink, you say pink. Young people, if they're reading and they miss a pink, interrupt them, okay? Who wants to read out loud? Nice and loud. We're gonna do it quickly because we have a lot of reading to do. Very loud. Then Jesus, pink, was Great. led by the spirit, pink, Great. into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, you are the son of God. Should God be pink? Son of God. That's all. That's a bit mer Isn't it interesting? The devil calls him the son of God. All right, son of God, pink. Command these stones to come bread. But he answered them and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And God should be pink. God's pink and man is pink. Okay. Next color, orange. Orange has to do with the devil. Dirty, why orange? Well, uh, orange is the color of Halloween, and they, you know, Halloween wasn't originally an evil thing, but it's been turned into that. So I use orange. Orange is for the devil, demons, and blatant enemies of God, like Goliath, Sennacherib, uh, Sam Balak. Very obvious enemies of God. So who wants to read nice and loud with orange? Gertie, I actually have a question for you real quick. Yes. So, you said pink for God, humans, and angels. Yes. Um, and it says, the tempter came and said to him, referring to Jesus, should yes. that be pink as well? Very good question. A very good question. He asked, do we do the pronouns as well? If you know what, what the text is talking about, you don't have to. If you want to, uh, you can go ahead and do the pronouns as well. Very good question. Sometimes, by noticing a certain pronoun, it does help you with the interpretation. Very good. Okay. So, who's going to read nice and loud for orange? Quickly! Got it. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Orange. Orange. Very good. After he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter, orange. Very good. So interesting here, in one small portion, young people, we have two different names for the devil. What were they? I already gave you one, okay? The devil, and then what, what, something that's very characteristic of his nature. Tempter. Tempter, very, very good. So, next color. Then we do green. Green stands for time. Why, Gertie? I don't know. Most plants are green and it takes time to grow. Okay? Now you'd be amazed, sometimes, Green, like one of the most powerful words in the Bible that sobers me whenever I think about it is a two-letter word, and it's green. It's from the parable of the sower. Matthew chapter 13, Luke chapter 8, and Mark chapter 4. You know what it is? The sower went out to sow his seed. And as he was sowing. In other words, during the sowing, the seed was falling on four groups of people. Jesus said the first three go to hell. And it was happening while the sowing was occurring. A little word like that. And I never noticed it, beloved, until I marked it with green and caught it. And then I was like, oh my dear. Whenever the word of God is preached, there are four kinds of soil in the audience. Every time. And while it's being preached, this parable of the sower is being fulfilled. I mean, it just... It just I can get on my face right now, but that's what this system helps me with. All right, so forgive me. So we're green. So who's going to read now? And all references to time. Oh, I missed one. You missed it. You missed it. Ben! And you, you might think, oh, Gertie, lighten up. But no, you'd be amazed when sometimes... When you have a certain portion of scripture, and then the next portion, and it's connected by then, it's very important, like right after that first portion. So very, very good. Then is green. Very good. 40 days and 40 nights, all green. Okay?
Very, very good. How many greens? Four. Quite a few, right? Next color, blue. Blue has to do with location. Now remember, man, you were reading through this a lot. Yep, remember, we're doing the four stomachs of the cow, though we do it a lot more than four times. Why, Michael? Once again, look up here. Why are we doing going through the same portion again and again and again? Here's why, young people. We're giving the Holy Spirit time to show us his interpretation. If you rush through the scripture, you miss a lot of God. Casual reading produces casual Christians. Light Bible reading produces light Christians. The more time, young people, you give to the Holy Spirit to give you the meaning of what he had these men write, the more illumination you're going to get. The light's going to come on. You're going to have worship coming from deep inside of you. We're going to go nuclear. Okay? Now, blue has to do with location. It's very important. Um, location in this text. All right, who wants to read it? Nice and loudly. Okay? But girls don't have big mouths. <laughs> Then Jesus was would then Jesus would was led up by the Spirit into the world. Oh, oh, you missed one. Up. Yep. Very, very good. Up. Yep. Blue. By the Spirit into the wilderness, blue. Very to good. Be tempted by the devil. Wait a minute. Who led Jesus into the wilderness? The Spirit. No. Spirit. Somebody said Spirit. it. The Holy. Wait a minute. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's leading the Son of God. Into the wilderness. For what? To be tempted. Time for his testing. You just notice more. And where did he lead him? Didn't lead him into the middle of Jerusalem. He led him out to the wilderness. Okay, go ahead. And after he had fasted for forty days and forty nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Excellent. Okay. We're trying very hard to get, taking our time, hoping the Holy Spirit is going to make this deep in our spirits. Now, how many of you have, uh, and let me just say this before we continue. There are, I have a lot of Bibles and they're marked so badly that I had to move to another Bible. I get it. All right, but I know there are, are, I have a lot of Bibles that I don't mark, I just have certain ones. So I understand if you don't feel comfortable marking your Bible, I get it. But I hope you can find some Bible that you will mark it, okay? Because it delights the Lord, yep. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, okay. Okay, isn't out of the mouth of God a place as well? I mean... Whoa, <laughs> that's pretty broad. <laughs> that's very good because that's what we're talking about. Okay. I said, remember God's words come from yeah. God out of his mouth, so to speak. Well, what, where is it before it's in God's mouth? It's deep in the depths of God. Thank you, brother, very much. Okay? So, I encourage you, young people, if you don't have a Bible, if you don't want to mark your, your favorite Bible, I encourage you to get another one, and they're all over the thrift stores uh, in this area. Get you one you can mark, uh, and I guarantee you'll be glad you did, okay? So, um, now, how many of you have Bibles, and it's going to be hard because, I, I'm sorry, you have papers, but how many of you remember if your Bible, when it has a pronoun that talks about God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit, in other words, the Godhead or Trinity, the pronouns for God are capitalized. Do you remember? Uh, they are? Mm. All right. How many of you, I know that New, New International Version, the NIV, does not capitalize. It used to bother me like crazy. And I said, Lord, why, don't, why in the world didn't I capitalize the pronouns that refer to you? And I found out many years later, you know why? Because in the Greek, the original language it was written in, they're not capitalized. But a lot of versions do, cap New King James does. I, I'm in the New American Standard, that capitalizes. Um, I think, uh, well, you, you probably know other versions. Uh, I think Amplify does. So anyway, this is for you. In case you have a Bible that you're marking, that the, cop the pronouns for God are not capitalized, we have another reason to read through it again to give the Holy Spirit time to open it up to us. We're, gonna, we're going to um, capitalize the pronouns for God. So who wants to read? Even if you're Bible, well, I don't know even in the paper that they're, they're capitalized, are they? They are. Bummer, they are, okay. But let's just read through it again and stop whoever's reading and say, you know, and he and him capitalize, okay? Just so we get it down. In case you have a Bible at home that you're going to mark that doesn't. Who wants to read? Nice and loudly. Okay. Very 
very good. Not, not yellow, but just say capitalize. Very good. If you are the salt of God, capitalize. Commanded that he show to King Greg what he capitalized. Answered and said, It is written, man capitalized shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Capitalize. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right, how many times have we read through it? Who can count? First time we read through it, what did we mark? Nothing. Nothing, right? Remember? Nothing. Second time, what was the color? Pink. Pink. Very good. Third time? Orange. Orange. Fourth time? Green. Green. Fifth time? Blue. Blue. Sixth time? Capitalize. Capitalize. Now, next color. Yellow. This is the one I've been longing for. Yellow. What do you mean? Yellow, I'm hoping by the time, now you're on your, is this the seventh reading? Yeah. Seven. I'm hoping by the seventh reading that the Holy Spirit has shown you things that you didn't see before you read it six times. That's the goal of the study method. So, I use yellow, sunshine, radiance, the glory of God. I use yellow for traits about God that you just stop while you're reading. And, wow. Something it says about God that he is, or that he says, or that he does, or about a godly person like Daniel. Daniel went up into his room and three day, three times a day he faced Jerusalem and prayed. Yellow. Why? Because I want to be like that. If it's something that you see in a godly man or woman in the Bible, godly traits that, wow, I, I don't do that or I'm not there. I want to be yellow. Something about the nature of God. Yellow. Something that God does or says. Yellow. Okay? So that's what I've been after. So who wants to read? And, and, and this is all... The Holy Spirit may be showing you a bunch of you different things uh, at the same time. So it isn't like you get the yellow. Like the other colors, you had to be exact. Yellow might be different. So I need someone to read through. And then if other people, let's say the person keeps reading. That's okay. But maybe you want to stop them and say yellow. Because it gripped you, but the Holy Spirit gripped them somewhere else. Okay? So who wants to read? And everyone can interrupt if, it, if they miss a yellow that you think should be yellow. Okay? All right, nice and loud, buddy. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Yes, I was hoping so. To be checked. Yeah, but, no, hold, hold, let me, I want to get it now. Was that you back there, bud? Did you say led? Thank you. Yes, oh, I was hoping you guys. Remember, Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God, the sons of God. And here we have the Son of God being led. By the Holy Spirit. Now remember, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, separate persons, all share the same being. They're all equal, but look at Jesus humbling himself, because he's the one of the three persons who became a man, and only him. And watch now, he's humbling himself, he's following the leading of the third person of the, of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit's leading, come Jesus, to the wilderness, you're going to be tempted. Jesus humbles himself. Wow. I'm so glad you caught that, alright? Led by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So you know, I was going to say none of you guys like fasting, do you? <laughs> no, no, nobody yelled. Yeah, no. yeah, right. Who does? That probably should be yellow, though. <laughs> That's thank you. Yep, yep. And I, you did nothing wrong, but young people. Wait, no, no, no. I want to elaborate. Young people, look at me. Kids and teenagers who grew up in Christian homes, they're dropping like flies, and they're very popular, and now they're very wealthy, and what they're doing is they're leading other young people astray, denying God like they chose to do. It's happening like crazy. Very famous Christian people who grew up in Christian homes, and they're walking away from God, and now they're on all these YouTube and all these venues bragging about it, <laughs> and they're drawing countless young people who follow them. Now, I said that for a reason. What text were we on? Forgive me again. Uh, oh, thank you, bro. The tempter came. Beloved, if you truly belong to Jesus, the tempter is going to come. Just be ready for it. Jesus has got you. The devil can't even think about you without his permission. So if he does come to you, there are three reasons why. Number one, more of God's 
God's glory is going to be revealed than if, it, than if God kept the devil from you. And if he didn't, yeah, then he'd be kept in front. Number two, if the devil is allowed to come to you, the second biggest reason is God wants to make you more like Jesus. And the third reason is for your good. Other than that, the devil can't plunder God's children. But for Jesus, our model, the tempter came. So just be ready. He's going to come to you a lot until the day you die. But every time he does, he can't get near you. All right, Father. All right, I'm in this temptation. He can't even think of me without your permission to glorify your name, Lord. All right, let's go. Yellow. Thank you. <laughs> Stop. Peace. Wait a minute. You're doing good, but this, and I, I have to get through an eruption and ask my wife. But, what are the very first recorded words of the devil in the New Testament? He just read them. If you are the Son of God. What were the first words of the devil in the Old Testament? Did God really say? Denying the Word of God in the Old Testament. The first words, denying the sonship of Jesus. And what, how do people go to hell? Whoever denies that Jesus came in the flesh is the Antichrist. Welcome to the devil. Okay, if you are the son of God. Uh, Yellow. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Katie's never, he's never volunteering again. All right, you interrupted with yellow. What part? Which part? Oh, command. Huh? Command. Command. Oh, so look at this. You ever think of this? The devil's telling Jesus what to do. Now remember, other times when demons, when Jesus would come into a place, demons would start freaking out. Jesus hadn't done anything. He just showed up. So isn't it amazing? I've often wondered that, Lord. Why isn't the devil now afraid of him? The devil's so deceived, of course, as he's pure evil. You know? But interesting, isn't it? That he wasn't even afraid to get near Jesus. Go ahead. Okay, sir. <laughs> He's our, he, you're our sacrifice. Answered and said. It is Answered and said. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's leaving. He's out of his room. We lost him. What was that about you? No, but you know what I love? I got to get this to you. Jacob's heard it before, but I got to tell you. The devil comes to Jesus and says, if you are the Son of God, remember, fill these stones become bread. What did Jesus say? Where did Jesus just come from before the wilderness scene? Where was he? Transfigured. He was baptized. Well, what happened when he was baptized? Did he lighten up? Lighten up! When he was baptized and he came out of the water, whose voice did he hear from heaven? God the Father! Who, the only time in human history that the Holy Spirit has ever been seen was at Jesus' baptism. How did he appear? Is it done? Isn't it amazing? Young people, you got to get this. The devil comes to Jesus, and when he says, if you're the Son of God, watch what Jesus doesn't say. Wait a minute. Weren't you at my baptism? I mean, like, the heavens parted. God the Father spoke, which isn't often. The Holy Spirit's only seen as a dove for the first time in human history. And the only time. You're asking me about the Son of God. How did he answer it? He didn't tell him that, did he? What did he say? It is written! It is written, it is written. It should be yell, 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 Okay? Are you done? <laughs> did you, are you done or are you ready to quit the church? <laughs> I think I'm fine. It is written! Jesus quoted the word of God. Okay? Uh, any other yellows before we lost him? Man shall not live by bread alone, right? I would say the whole last time. Like, yes. The whole last time, okay. And what time do we have to end? Uh, 8.30. Oh, Christ. I mean, I mean, 8.30 is like, no, right, your right, parents no, are okay. here, so. I want your parents to love me. Okay, right. we're doing great then. I was so worried about time. Okay, so now, next marker. What number is this now? Eight. What reading? The eighth, eight, okay. Now it's red underliner. Now we read it through again. And if something yellow really struck you, where you're in awe and you can't stop thinking about it, you know what? Many times when I'm reading a text like this, I get to like a couple words and I can't read anymore because those two words or three words have me in such awe. I can't go on. 
That's, that's a yellow underlined in red. Okay, so let's read through it again. Who wants to volunteer? Probably everybody's scared now. Who hasn't read yet? Who hasn't read yet? And you tell us when we get it near a yellow and you think it should be your underlined in red. You want to do it again, huh? He's a glutton for punishment. Okay. okay, what's your name? Evan. Evan, cool, okay. No, Zeva. Zeva, he's getting even with me, okay. Evan. Okay, now guys, get ready to interrupt him. You think the yellow should be underlined in red? I'm not salty. <laughs> I'm not what? I'm not salty. Say red, yellow, whatever, I'm not salty. Okay. Got, but it, it, it defeats the purpose. You've got to stop, honey. And just let the, let, I really want to hear, I want to hear what the young people are saying should be read, though. Okay? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So let's do it again and let's go very slow. Nine and, nine. and I want to hear, yell out, young people, um, what should be underlined in red. I mean, does it have to be yellow or you could just like. Well, no, you might find a red of something. Very good, thank you. I'm sorry. It could be something that's not yellow and uh, underlined in red. Very good. Okay. Yeah, all red. that red. Red, led, Jesus being led by the Holy Spirit, okay? To be tempted. Yes. To be tempted by the devil. Red. And, and after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became red. I have a question. Is Jesus, was Jesus tempted in the same way that we are? What is the major difference between the temptation of the Lord and the temptation of his people? What do we have that Jesus doesn't have? Sin nature. No sin! How many of you have ever been in a... I don't even know if they do it anymore. Probably too dangerous. But how many of you have ever been on a, on a, on a merry-go-round? With the horses going up and down? Carousel? Yeah. Better. Okay. So I don't know if they do it. It was a long time ago. And, but when, when I was a kid, I think that you go around and they would have a little thing sticking outside and it had a ring. You tried to put your finger in. It was really dumb, wasn't it? No, still it. Do they really? You're on the, ho you're on the merry-go-round. And you're going around and you try to catch this ring on your finger as you're going around. But Knobles still does it. My family, I never have been to Knobles. My wife and children went many years ago. But anyway, well, Gertie, what are you talking about? Unlike Jesus, when the devil comes to tempt us, he can get rings of sin inside of us. Jesus has nothing inside. But still he was oppressed by the devil, by his very presence. I'm sure Jesus was deeply grieved. The devil was lying to him at all times. Kind of impressed by his presence, the Holy Son of God, going through every temptation as we do, but without sin, Hebrews 5. Um, so anyway, very good, very good, no sin. Okay, where were we? Uh, I think it's three. Verse three. Verse three, okay. Speaks probably very good. important. Now, I, I went, I had already had all my object lessons here yesterday, but I thought of two more that I, re I went back in my basement. I was going through all my object lesson bins, and I have many, but I couldn't find these, and I finally found them. And so, Gertie, why hold on? Here's why. This should have been at the beginning of the meeting, but I want to emphasize this. When you come, this, is this fusion? Yes. Okay. When you come to Fusion every week, what does Brother Derek, Pastor Derek, do to you to cause you to love God more, want to serve Him more faithfully, love each other, and, and yield to the Lord? Does He wave a magic wand over you? Yeah. Or do you come up in line at the end of the service and does He have this like serum that, you know, all right, one at a time, and He sticks it in your arm and it's called Jesus Loving Serum. And so it gets inside you, and oh, I just love Jesus more, and I'm going to live for him all week. Is that what Pastor Derek does? No! Any pastor in the world would say millions of dollars that though. these existed. What does Pastor Derek do? He speaks what to you? The word of God. Words. Words. Think about it, young people. All that we get that stirs our hearts with love for God is mostly words. That's why it's so important that they're words from God. And if that
that's the perfect climate. I wasn't going to use this object lesson, but we're going to use it. Ah, I'm probably going to be embarrassed. But this, I'm afraid to ask you. Mommy, anyone remember the movie Aladdin? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do! Wow! Great movie. Yeah. Oh, uh, have a new one. The old one's the best. 1992. Yeah. Yeah. Now, opening scene. Opening scene. They were out in the desert. It was night. Who was out there? The evil. The, who was the villain? The car, right? Who was he with? That little guy. I had to spit a few throats to get it, but. Remember? Do you have it? So remember? They had two halves of a golden scarab or a beetle. How many remember that scene out in the desert? All right, now, they were both solid gold. Each of them was worth a lot of money, just half of it. But when did it become amazingly valuable when they did what? Put them together. Then what happened? The very first thing that happened when they put them together, what happened? A lot of kids missed this part. What did it do first? It lit up. It glowed. Then what did it do? Flew away. Flew away. And where did it take them? The cave of wonders. Remember? Word of God, Spirit of God. Both are invaluable. Both are powerful in themselves. But when you put them together, that's what takes you to the cave of wonders. And you're adoring Jesus like you've never done before. That's the purpose of this method. Now we have a half an hour to quiz. Uh, it actually, believe it or not, there's another step you can do. If you're really knocked off the socks and you fall off your chair studying, you can be yellow, underlined in red, and